good morning, everyone. Um, I, again, I want to welcome everyone for joining us today for a very important call on navigating the DOL fiduciary rule. Uh, we have got a terrific turnout. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we've got a lot of new names with us this morning, and I want to welcome you. Um, my name is Tom Vukovic. I head up the Financial Products Division with Insurance Network America. And um, as always, we are committed to providing you with great ideas and tools to continue to build your practice, as well as timely information that you need to know about. Uh, and our focus today will be exactly that. Um, as you all have seen, uh, there has been an, a flood of ongoing articles, news, and information about the status of the DOL fiduciary rule. Um, at times, not all of it is accurate. And so uh, today we're hopefully going to, we are going to give you exactly uh, the latest update on what is uh, going on with the DOL fiduciary rule. Uh, but all that being said, I'm certain that the number one thing on your minds is what does this all mean to your clients, your practice, and your livelihood? Uh, what does a post-DOL world look like for your day-to-day -day business? And uh, what do things look like if there's a delay? What do you need to do now to be ready for all scenarios? So we're really glad you chose to chose to join us today for the call since we have all the answers for you. Uh, we're going to provide you with an accurate and up-to-date status of the DOL ruling, as well as provide you with clear direction and a clear compass and roadmap to follow. Uh, the one positive takeaway I want you all to take with you today um, is that uh, we are here to help you partner uh, and help you thrive through these changes, not just maneuver through um, the DOL changes, but we want to help you thrive through these changes. So uh, during today's call, if you have questions, please use the GoToWebinar to ask your questions. If uh, we have time towards the end, uh, we will do our best to answer all your questions. If we do happen to run out of time, uh, we will absolutely follow up with you. And uh, if you have questions walking away from this, please don't hesitate to wait for a call reach out to us at 800-456-7999. You can see the number there on your screen. And um, for those of you that have not contracted with us before or given us a look, I encourage you to do that. Um, we are here as a true partner to help you thrive through these changes. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our featured speaker today, our President and Chief Operating Officer, Lori Beck. And Lori, I will hand it off to you. Hey, thank you, Tom. You know, and I, I want to reiterate what Tom said, thanking you for spending some time talking to us about the DOL rule today. This is our fourth webinar to bring our producers up to speed on what we know, where we are, and frankly, it seems to be changing so often that even though Insurance Network has been following this from the beginning, it can seem daunting even for us to keep up with it all. Um, we can't imagine how hard it is to be an advisor in this world, probably the people most greatly impacted by this rule, and, and yet you, as Tom alluded to, are probably being inundated with information, and sadly, some of it is misinformation. I feel like Tom gave me a really Tom order here when he said, or tall order here when he said that I was going to uh, give you all the facts and be 100% accurate, and I will tell you I'm going to do my very best. But this rule sometimes changes by the hour, and so um, we're going to do our best to bring it to you and bring you everything that we know as we do today. And certainly it's not just because we're reading the rule. We've been studying this from the beginning. We have been studying the rule, talking to industry experts, talking to legislators, really trying to stay in touch with Washington, D.C. to make sure that we are as close to the front of this as possible. Because let's be clear, as written, this rule is going to change the way we all do business. Not only the way you do business, but the way your carriers and broker dealers and registered investment advisors and banks and plan sponsors and IMOs do business. We're all going to have to change some of the ways we do things if this rule stands as it is today. And at INA, we don't ever want you to feel like you are alone in the battle. 
And so once again today, we're going to talk about navigating these changes, and we're going to talk about doing it together. Get my screen to change. Modern technology. So to do that, we want to give you as much information as we can, and we want to try to cover the things that we believe are the most pressing on your mind. And we've covered many of these things in previous sessions, but given the number of new attendees we have on this call, and the changes that have occurred, frankly, even in the last six weeks, we have a lot to cover in today's call. But what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to go over how does this rule impact you and your clients, which products are affected, how it, this rule impacts those people you do business with, what are your best next steps, how and when will it impact you and your practice. We're going to talk about Will it be overturned in the courts? Will it be delayed? Will the new administration rescind the rule? Can they rescind the rule? Can they rescind it in time? How does Insurance Network intend to adapt to comply with the new rules? And then really most importantly, what does this mean to you? So as a recap, let's just take a step back and get into what this rule is all about. This rule has actually been in the works for about six years. But the more recent timeline started in June of, 2015, or June of 2015. That's when the Department of Labor published their proposed set of regulations to expand the DOL definition of a fiduciary. In April of last year, they finalized new regulations that included an expanded definition of a fiduciary, as well as new and amended prohibited transaction exemptions. These rules were effective in April of 2016 with an applicability date of April of 2017. That is really important, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But one of the things we heard early on um, in 2017 when President Trump signed an executive order that said, hey, we're going to roll back implementing any new rules that are not yet effective some people thought that because the Department of Labor fiduciary rule was not yet applicable, that this rule was folded into all of that. Not true. This rule has been on the books and technically effective for just almost a year now. In January of this year, the Department of Labor released a long-awaited IMO exemption. I'll get into a little bit about what that means in just a minute. Um, but let's talk, too, about what's been happening this year, particularly since President Trump took over. Now, in February of 2017, the Trump administration sent a memo to the Department of Labor. And in that, they stated that they wanted them to review the rule for possible changes or revocation. Now, I'm sure you're like the rest of us who first heard that he was going to implement a six-month delay and, in fact, most of us got emails celebrating the pushback and what appeared to be the beginning of the end of this rule. Then the actual memo to the Department of Labor was provided and it was revised from its draft form and the final memorandum did not include the language of a delay. Now this was most likely a procedural issue since again there are specific rules and processes that apply to rules that are already in place. And remember, this rule was effective almost immediately upon its release last year, with the applicability dates pushed forward to 2017. So again, it's a critical piece to understand because that's what makes it so hard to roll back. That's what makes all of these different things going on right now so much more complicated. But in any event, the Department of Labor did file for a delay with the OMB, and they came back with their um, really blessing that yes you can, but in doing so they also kind of upped the game a little bit for the Department of Labor. There are different rules that apply depending on the financial impact a specific rule or rule change is expected to have. And when the Department of Labor filed this with the OMB, they filed it as one that had minimal financial impact. That would have allowed them a lot more flexibility in delaying this rule on their own, and perhaps even doing that without a comment period at all, or a very limited comment period. But when the OMB came back and said that this rule change would have a significant financial impact, 
that limited what the Department of Labor could do, which we believe is probably why yesterday the Department of Labor finally filed for their delay, but it's only a 60-day delay, and it's following a 15-minute, or I wish it were 15-minute, a 15-day comment period. So the bottom line is, even though we expect this rule to be delayed by 60 days, um, we won't really know that until the 15-day comment period is over, at which time they will make their decision and will most likely state that the initial first phase compliance will now be effective in June of 2017. In fact, June 9th is the date right now. Um, regardless of that, January 2018, when full compliance is currently required, has not changed despite this initial delay. So, so what does it all mean? Well, you know, it means that the Department of Labor has agreed. They're going to go in. They're going to look at the rule. They're going to evaluate it on the basis that the Trump administration requested that they evaluate it. They're going to determine whether or not they believe it should be rescinded, revoked, revised. Um, but I'm going to tell you, they're going to have an uphill battle. Once a rule is in effect, they are always going to have bigger challenges getting it back off the books. And you couple this with a rule that has really pretty sound bites. It really, I mean, ask anybody on this call, do you believe that every advisor should act in the best interest of the client when they're making product recommendations? And of course, we would all say yes. And yet the proponents of this rule say that if we oppose this rule, clearly we do not want what is in best interest of the clients. And so there's a real kind of a, a public perception problem that's going to take place here as well. Um, the court battles, where are they at? Well, we're zero and four. So four court battles have been heard. Four court battles have been um, initially ruled on. And the um, industry lost all four. Now, in all four cases, we expect appeals, and we don't know what will happen with the appeals. You know, in the original filings, the Department of Labor fought hard. They brought in the Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice fought hard. And the question now remains, will the Department of Labor, once they finally get a new secretary, will they fight as hard in court? We don't know. Um, but what will the per public perception be if they don't? So again, it's a mess. And so now what? Well, what we have to do is we really truthfully have to talk about what happens if nothing changes. So let's just, again, I'm going to do a quick review for those of you who were not on our previous calls. I'll try to do it fast enough that it's not boring for those of you who were. You know, this rule as it stands only applies to certain sales in certain qualified markets but it's a pretty big sector of our industry. Affected accounts include IRAs, HSAs, MSAs, educational savings accounts, KEO plans, solo plans, 401ks, and any product to be funded with a rollover from one of these plans. So for example, a life insurance product that might be funded using required minimum distributions from a qualified plan is subject to this new fiduciary standard. And so a lot of people look at this as the annuity rule or the mutual fund rule or the stock rule. It's not. It is bigger than that. But today, to focus on the accounts that affect most of you on this call, we're going to spend our time talking about the rule's impact on IRA rollovers from a 401k. We're going to talk about IRA to IRA direct transfers and we're going to talk about the establishment of new IRA accounts. But let's start with the most important question. Who is a fiduciary under the new rule? Does this rule even impact you? Well, a fiduciary can be a broker, investment advisor, insurance agent, or any other type of advisor receiving compensation for for providing advice that is individualized or specifically directed to a particular plan sponsor, plan participant, or IRA owner for consideration in making a retirement investment decision, now going to be a fiduciary. And such decisions can include, but are not limited to, which assets to sell or purchase, 
and whether to roll over funds from an employer-based IRA or plan to an IRA. Now, an important note to make today is that an investment advisor is already subject to a fiduciary standard, whereas a registered rep in the entire insurance industry as a whole is subject to a suitability standard. But this new rule brings fiduciary standards to the registered rep and the insurance-only producer. But it doesn't stop there. It also redefines investment advice. Let's start with what is the current definition under ERISA today. There is a five-pronged definition for investment advice. Investment advice is considered to be such if you are making investment recommendations on a regular basis with a mutual understanding that that is what you're doing, that the advice that you're providing is the primary basis for the plan's decisions or the participant's decisions, and that it's individualized to that plan's needs. But the new rule changes some of that, and the new rule states that it includes one-time advice without the regular basis condition. There's no longer a need for a mutual understanding of parties. Advice may address particular investment needs or a particular investment decision and does not necessarily need to be individualized to that particular transaction. The client only needs to receive advice, and that advice does not need to be the primary basis for the decision. I will tell you this bullet is the one that I believe has the most people nervous. It also expressly revises the definition to cover investment management recommendations. So what does all of that mean to you? Well, once you're determined to be a fiduciary, you are subject to a fiduciary standard of care. And a fiduciary standard of care means that the, you must act solely in the client's best interest. You must disclose any conflict or potential conflicts of interest. And conflicts of interest include Variable compensation, I pushed too many buttons, sorry about that. Um, variable compensation, such as commissions, bonuses, and incentives. I apologize for moving the slide too quickly. I'm trying to go through fast so we can get to the good stuff. In any event, When an advisor becomes a fiduciary under the rule, the advisor's conduct is then governed by the fiduciary prohibited transaction rules in ERISA and in the Internal Revenue Code. And guys and ladies, this is a biggie. Because generally speaking, those rules prohibit advisors from receiving commissions from third parties unless the advisor meets the requirements for an exemption. Those transactions are literally prohibited unless you meet the new DOL fiduciary rules that include exemptions that, if their requirements are satisfied, would allow you to receive reasonable commissions. And I just have to make a parting shot at the DOL right now. Um, we still don't have a definition of reasonable compensation coming out of the Department of Labor and yet we must all comply with this reasonable compensation rule as of, well, next month. In any event, let's get back on track. These exemptions, these exemptions that will allow you to receive insurance commissions for the products that you sell are 8424 and VICE, also known as BIC. So what is the 8424 exemption? Well, it's actually been around for a long time. And this new rule simply expanded it, albeit it expanded it by a lot. And in the proposed rules, indexed annuities were included under the 84 exemption. But at the last minute, they were moved under the more onerous exemption called VICE. And we'll get into that in a minute. But let's go over 8424 first. Because this would be the rule that would apply to really all other insurance product transactions that you have in the market. So the way this works is that if you meet the requirements, you may receive variable compensation such as commissions, but to meet the requirements, you must 
acknowledge in writing with your client that you are a fiduciary and that you agree to adhere to a best interest standard of care. And any statements you have made may not be material misleading. And this is not just the statement made in the sales process. This could be advertising. This could be seminar materials. This could be a flyer that you sent. It could be an email. It could be a Facebook message. Because remember it said earlier that those, those things considered to be advice didn't necessarily have to be relevant to the particular sale that was being discussed. And so statements cannot be material, materially misleading. And also, the failure to describe a material conflict of interest is deemed to be misleading. Don't forget that they consider variable compensation, in other words, commissions, to be a material conflict of interest under this rule. That means that the advisor is going to have to disclose his compensation and any other potential conflicts of interest. Before the sale is finalized, you're going to have to provide disclosures to the IRA owner in writing and the IRA owner must, in writing, acknowledge receipt of those disclosures. Also, as stated before, the advisor's compensation may be no more than reasonable, and the advisor cannot receive any additional financial incentives, for example, trips, awards, and bonuses that are strictly based on production levels are not normally going to be allowed going forward. Now this means that carriers are going to have to take a look at any variable compensation offered to their agents and to their marketing organizations. And marketing organizations are going to have to evaluate the extras we provide to make sure we're not getting you into trouble without meaning to. Now this does not mean we won't be able to provide them anymore. It doesn't mean we're going to have to completely change our value propositions to you. It just simply means we have to take a look at how you qualify and also, when we go on trips, we're going to have to look at what the primary focus of the trip is. So while they may change, we do not expect our ability to host events for you to go away. So let's move on to the BIC for a minute and talk about that. Because the BIC is one of the reasons that this rule is really taking the industry by storm. And, and it isn't just, I mean, the rest of this is problematic. But this BIC exemption is really a challenge. So again, originally it was expected that the indexed annuities would be with all other financial um, insurance products sold, covered under 8424. So the industry was stunned when the Department of Labor moved indexed annuities instead to the BIC. And we had no time to respond to that because this was in the final rule that was immediately effective. The most significant part of the BIC is the requirement that this best interest contract be signed not by you and your client, but by the financial institution and the client. And the financial institution that signs and enters into that contract with your client takes on a lot of responsibility and risk in doing so. Now there are four versions of BICs. And for the purposes, again, of this audience, we're going to focus on the full-blown BIC, which will be required in January of 2018, assuming the rule is not changed beforehand. So the best interest contract, this BIC, is a written contract executed at the time of policy issuance. And it must include the following, a definition of terms and fiduciary standard of care, some general disclosures of compensation and conflicts of interest, specific compensation figures upon request, compliance policies for mitigating conflicts, and mandatory arbitration with reasonable venue permitted, but it must not limit class action rights. This has been a real big deal as well, and in fact, one of the lawsuits was solely based on this problem. Other things about the BIC requirements, so transaction disclosures for each investment focusing on fiduciary standards and conflicts. There is a one-year relief of advising purchase of the same product. So if you bought a product and you had a BIC signed and two months later they put more money into the product, 
they wouldn't have to have a new VIX signed. If they put more money into that product in month 14, they would. So you may expect to see flexible premium annuities in the qualified space make changes in the post-DOL world to only allow new premiums for the first 12 months of the policy. So who signs the VIC? Well, the policyholder or investor and, again, a financial institution. So who's a financial institution? Well, as defined under the rule, that would be a broker-dealer, a bank, an RIA, an insurance carrier, or an IMO, a marketing organization like us, but only if approved by the DOL. Now, initially it was expected that the Department of Labor was going to provide a reasonable path for an established, reputable marketing organization to become a financial institution. And 22 applied for this status, while another 30 to 40 made their intent to apply very clear. And so the industry was stunned in January when yet again the Department of Labor released something that nobody expected. And they released their IMO exemption which makes it all but impossible for most IMOs to qualify. And in fact, if you go out and read that, you will see an extreme bias against indexed annuities in that IMO exemption release. That is something very few people are talking about, but something that certainly should concern all of us that are in the indexed annuity market. But one of the things that happened with respect to this IMO exemption is that, well, first of all, the stipulations put in place are greater than any imposed on any broker-dealers or RIAs in the same space. In fact, I've heard from many people that they believe this to be one of the most discriminatory releases from the Department of Labor against the insurance industry they've ever seen. But it is what it is. And it is expected that only five national marketing organizations will be able to meet the standards set forth under the Department of Labor rules that were released. This was just one more in a series of setbacks that we have all seen as we've tried to come into compliance with this extremely complex set of rules. So for an insurance-only producer, this creates a new dilemma. One of the challenges is that while an IMO who works with you knows you, knows your ethics, knows your business practices, and therefore might be willing to take on the risk of signing a VIC for you and your client, they may not be able to do so. And this means you have to find someone who will. But that can be a challenge as well. Because the risk to the financial institution signing the document, again, includes private rights of action by the client in the future. It includes excise tax penalties for breaches and added scrutiny by regulators. For a sale, the financial institution did not witness. Now, this part of the rule is currently slated again to be applicable in January of 2018. Before I go any further, I do want to say, if you're working with Insurance Network and you're an insurance-only producer, don't panic, get off the call, and start drinking right now. We do have this covered for you. So, but let's talk for a minute about this delay. You know, that's what happens in January. What happens next month or June if the delay is successful? Well, as we said earlier, there's a long road ahead to revise or rescind this rule. So while we continue to hope for the best, we simply must be, compare, be prepared to comply on April 10, 2017. We just have to be. So what do you do today? Well, our first suggestion is that you be heard. Make your comments and thoughts on the subject be known. Continue to educate yourself by attending webinars like this and others, and prepare for what this state means so that you understand how it affects the way you do business. So what exactly does happen on this rules applicability date, whenever that date might be? Well, phase one compliance states that you must adhere to the impartial conduct standards, including you must give prudent advice in line with the client's best interest, avoid misleading statements, 
receive no more than reasonable compensation, notify your clients of your fiduciary stand status, reveal all material conflicts of interest, and designate someone to address those material conflicts or conflicts of interest if they arise, and designate someone to monitor your adherence to the impartial conduct standards. So again, this means that each of you who will be writing in the qualified space is going to need to designate this entity. And if you're in a registered rep, this will most likely be your broker-dealer who already supervises your activities. If you're an investment advisor, this will most likely be your RIA who again is in a similar role. But if you're an insurance-only producer, you need to be talking to your IMO and asking them what they have in place for you to be able to continue to work in the space. And as I said, here at INA, we have reached an agreement with a financial institution who we will be paying to sign your BICs while providing you with the ability to maintain your independence, which we know is why you became an independent producer to begin with. You know, in addition, starting in 2017, as soon as this rule goes into effect, you should ensure that your E&O coverage includes protection for complaints that may arise from best interest and prudent care standards. Because if you get sued, you need to have the protection in place to protect your business. You need to document all client communications during the discovery and sales processes because, again, if five years from now somebody comes back to you and says, John, tell me about what happened in your client communications. How did you meet? What discovery did you do? What was your sales process? You're going to have to be able to show that. You're going to have to conduct a thorough fact-finding of the client's financial picture and needs. And I'm sure most of you already do this, but you may not be doing it to the extent the Department of Labor expects when they measure whether or not you had enough information to ensure that the products recommended are in the client's best interest. In addition, you have to have a seamless process in place to ensure that all disclosures are provided in a timely manner to your potential investor. Remember, some of these have to be done before the sale is finalized, so you can't rely on it to be provided by the carrier. You have to rely on it being provided by you, your IMO, your broker-dealer, your RIA, or some other entity, because it has to be done. But here's the great news. We're going to be bringing all of this to our advisors later this month. And we're excited to tell you that these platforms that we're going to bring you will not only ensure your compliance with the new rules, but they're going to do so while helping you identify more sales opportunities for you and much needed solutions for your clients and prospects. We will also have an E&O coverage option available that will provide you the coverage you need at an extremely affordable price. So if you're already part of the INA team, rest assured that we have your back. If you're not working with INA yet, we would love to have a conversation with you about how we can help. The challenge is we've now taken up so much time today covering the rule that we won't be able to go through these programs in detail. But we are going to set up a follow-up webinar to walk you through it all. We encourage you to reach out to the team at Insurance Network after this call if you'd like to be included in that training meeting. A couple of other things that we should cover that we expect to change, and you've probably already seen this, products are going to become more streamlined in the fixed indexed annuity space and more creative in the fixed annuity space. And we're already seeing it. American Equity just came out with some new products. North Americans and talks about them. Allianz has got some new things going on. We are seeing new products coming out in kind of um, anticipation of this rule, trying in many cases to keep some of these products over into 8424 while still providing you the income riders and flexibility and ability to protect your clients' assets while helping them grow for the future at the same time. 
So we've got a lot of things coming for you on the product horizon. We do expect that hybrid and probably more complex indexes may become less common. There's a huge spotlight on these already from a compliance standpoint. And one of the things you read as you go through all of the documents coming out of the Department of Labor is that they believe indexed annuities are extremely complicated. And so these hybrid indexes that are backcasting dates that they really don't have any good information for because the indexes didn't occur at that time, they're going to have to kind of change some things up, if you will, to keep everybody out of hot water. We do expect compensation for products to become more levelized amongst carriers and products. Not necessarily go down, although I saw something this morning that the bank channel is now saying that they expect commissions to be capped at 3% for all products offered through the bank channel. That is not what I'm hearing through the insurance channels. So we don't expect that you're going to see a lot of reduction in compensation. Um, but we do expect that it's going to become more levelized, that they're going to have to justify it. And so what you might see is that perhaps a 10-year product with a relatively complex index might offer one level of compensation for you, while a five-year product um, with high guarantees might offer a different um, compensation for you. But we do expect it to, to change. And those compensation models that include production bonuses, and many of the carriers we work with offer them, if you hit a certain target of premium, your compensation retroactively goes up. Those have been specifically targeted by the Department of Labor, and therefore we specifically expect to see those changed. And we've already heard much about this, and I'm sure you as licensed agents under some of these carriers are hearing the same things. They're either going away or they're being modified, or they're being offered for the first quarter of 2017 only. Now, we are hearing from some of the carriers that if the rule is delayed, pushed back, perhaps they will look at their um, production bonuses on a quarterly basis. So we're just going to have to wait and see what happens with respect to that. Again, I want to encourage you to be typing in your questions to the left. I've gone through this pretty quickly. I did this on purpose. I know I had a lot to cover, but I also wanted to get to a point where we could field a few of the questions that you have, um, whether they relate to the changes that are on your screen right now or relate to any of the things that I've talked about today. So what's next? Well, first of all, we're in this together. You know, this is not a situation where we can survive without you. And probably more than ever, I think advisors are no longer going to be able to survive without a good, solid partner working with them hand in hand in this. I think the days of being able to work through three, four, five IMOs to try to negotiate the best comp for a specific product, those days might have to go away a little bit because you might find that some of those marketing organizations are um, right there partnering with you. Some of them are not. Um, I'm concerned about what some of our competitors are doing and, and some of the positions that they're taking. And I can't answer to what they're doing. I can only answer to what we're doing. And what we're doing is we're going to take care of our producers, whether you're a registered rep working with us via your broker-dealer, or you are a IAR or an RIA working with us on your insurance products, or you're an insurance-only producer that is new to us or somebody that's been working with us for the last 30 years, Insurance Network is going to be there for you today, tomorrow, and in the future. As a little plug, we're in our 30th year of servicing independent agents across the country, and we fully expect 30 plus more in the future. So what does that really mean? Well, one, we're going to continue to advocate on your behalf in Washington, D.C. One of the things I would encourage you to do is the National Association of Fixed Annuities is going to have their meeting on the Hill in June, an opportunity we expect at that point that the Department of Labor is still going to be in flux. Most people believe that this initial 60-day delay 
is going to be followed by another delay. I don't know if that's true. Um, I've been surprised by a lot of things that I thought were going to be one way so far and have gone another. But regardless, Congress can change this too. So in June, we should know a lot more. We should know more about the delay coming out of Department of Labor. And we should also have an opportunity to talk to our legislators and get them to represent our industry and our clients in a way that makes sense. We can provide a best interest standard to our client without 1,500 pages of regulations telling us how to do it. Let's make sure people who are actually on the street talking to clients every single day, like you, are in these meetings. And if you want more information, Tom and I are going to be in DC in June. You want to go with us, reach out to us, and we'll tell you what you need to know in order to get there. Learn more about the platforms that are available to you through Insurance Network that will provide you with a clear path to compliance while allowing you to do more of what you do best. I can't say this enough. We are so excited about these platforms that even if the Department of Labor came out tomorrow and said, never mind, we are killing this rule, we're going to figure out a way to make it go away, and we never see the light of day of this fiduciary standard mess again in our lifetime. Insurance Network is still going to bring these platforms to you because we love them. We think they are going to help you do business in ways you've never done business before, and we can't wait to show them to you. So what we would like to encourage you to do, and again, I'm going to go back to Tom here in a second and let him ask questions, and then he and I will field them depending on what the questions are. Um, we've got probably just a couple of minutes to do that. But call Insurance Network as well. We have annuity specialists here. These guys have been, and gal, have been spending a ton of time staying in front of this, staying on top of this. I'm here. Tom's here. They're here. We're all here for you. Call us and tell us what you need. Also call us and tell us if you want to be part of the webinar we're going to set up to go over these new platforms and programs and get you some good training and tell you how they're all going to work to make your business better um, going forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom. And uh, Tom, do we have any questions out there? Oh, yes, we do. Of course. Uh oh uh, OK. No, no, it, this, is, this is terrific. So I hope this will just kind of, some of us will revisit uh, some of the things you covered. Um, first of all, uh, question of, does this include rollovers from a federal government plan to an IRA uh, within an FIA? So that's a good question, and there have been a lot of questions about that. We've heard the questions, you know, if I'm rolling from a 457 municipal plan over to an IRA, what about a 403B? And those plans are not governed by ERISA, and so as long as it is a 403B to 403B or a 457 to 457 um, rollover, doesn't impact it. But it is the legal opinion of the people that I've spoken with that if you roll over a 403B to a newly established IRA, because the newly established IRA is subject to these rules, that rollover would be subject to the fiduciary standard. Great. Next question is, does disclosure of compensation mandate the amount of commission or just the fact that you are receiving a commission? Yeah, so that's also interesting. And again, I would like to point out that one of the most disappointing things that I think we have all felt about the um, rule is that it was, um, it was passed, basically implemented, whatever you want to call it, because it's not a law, it's a rule, um, and immediately went into effect. And when it did, they said, we are going to come out with all of these FAQs that are going to help give you all the answers that you need. And then when lawsuits started to be filed, they kind of stopped providing us with some of that specific guidance. But in general, what we are being told is that it will be, um, it has to be disclosed in general unless they request it to be provided in specifics. 
Now, um, I have also heard from others that they are interpreting what they've heard so far to mean you've got to tell them the exact dollar amount. Now, I'll tell you, one of the things I think as an industry we've got to get over is feeling embarrassed by how much an advisor makes on an annuity sale. You know, I believe what you're paid is reasonable. And most of the carriers and the industry experts that I've talked to believe the same. First of all, your insurance commissions come from the insurance carrier, not out of the client's funds. Second of all, while you get paid that in most cases in a heaped manner, all in one lump sum, you continue to service that client. And so one of the things with our new platform that I'm really excited about is it takes the compensation that you receive and it shows how much that compensation is spread out over the years that we both know you service that client. And so I believe it starts telling an entirely different story where people will stand and say, well, a 1% fee a year is a much better deal for the investor than a 6.5% one-time insurance commission. And our new platform is going to debunk that myth. Okay. Um, that was a very yeah. long answer to a short question, but I don't have the specifics simply because the Department of Labor hasn't provided them. And so we're all kind of winging it, if you will, with respect to what we believe today. Great. We've got some great questions here, so I want to thank everybody. Um, next one is, uh, you mentioned something to the effect that the situation would not possibly apply to insurance producers. What products are insurance products, IULs, et cetera, FIAs without qualified funds? Hmm. I, I so believe the question I'm not is, sure. I may yeah. have misspoke. Yeah. Um, but let me just kind of go back to what is the, what does this rule cover? This rule is about qualified money. And so if you're selling a life insurance product and they're using money out of their savings account um, that is not in a qualified account of any kind, this rule right now doesn't touch that transaction. Um, if you're selling an indexed annuity and they're cashing in a CD that is not in a qualified tax deferred you know, account, this currently does not affect that transaction. Does that make sense? Yes. If I didn't answer that question, shoot me an email and I'll try to, try to answer it better. Right, and we'll be following up with you as well to elaborate and answer anything you have. And if, if you don't want to wait, call us. Um, the next question I think is, uh, another good one is, what is the IMO FIA exemption requirements that made it impossible? And I'm assuming this is referring to the January 15th uh, IMO exemption. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so originally what everyone was told was that as a marketing organization, I mean, let's just take Insurance Network, for example. We've been in business for 30 years. We have a extremely loyal base of advisors who do a great job for their clients. We are extremely financially stable. Um, we are a mid-sized marketing organization, so we're not a giant, but we're not a baby either. We're a mid-sized marketing organization. Um, we have zero complaints of any comp any kind. We have never once had to file a um, E&O claim against our E&O insurance. I mean, we, we're a reputable company. And it was believed that reputable IMOs that could demonstrate, you know, we have a compliance officer, we have suitability standards in, in place, we spend a lot of time training and helping and guiding our clients, we have a full product due diligence, so we make sure that you know, when we're looking at products, I can't tell you how many times Tom gets a call or I get a call or a marketer gets a call that says, hey, I've got this brand new product I heard about. Can you bring it on board? And we do a full due diligence of the product and have to say no because it doesn't meet our standards. So in other words, um, 
we do a pretty good job of making sure the consumer is protected. And, and so it was interesting that the Department of Labor entire best um, exemptions and in financial institutions and fiduciary standard, all of this is about best interest and compliance and you know, uh, re procedures and policies. And when they released the exemption, none of that was brought up. None of it was brought up. What was brought up was basically that indexed annuities are extremely complex products, that they're not even sure they have a place in the, um, in the qualified markets, and that unless you have done $1.5 billion in indexed annuities in each of the preceding three years, you don't even have an opportunity to ask for the right to be a um, financial institution. And $1.5 billion is a lot of indexed annuities. And um, so that was part of it. But then they also went further to talk about cash reserves that had to be put in place that equal 1% of the um, annuity production that you have done in those last three years. So, you know, again, you talk 1.5 billion, 1%, that's a lot of cash reserves to have that um, set back. Higher cash reserves than even some insurance carriers have to have. And after all, we're not selling those products. We're not responsible for paying out the benefits on those products. So it was an interesting, um, it was an interesting provision. Another provision in there had to do with insurance. It requires that the IMO have an insurance policy in place to cover any possible lawsuits and that you had to fund 95% um, of the risk. In other words, the deductible could only be 5% of the total um, risk that was being protected. And that's an extremely expensive insurance policy. A, a financially stable um, business doesn't need an insurance policy to you know, have a deductible so low. And so these are just a few of the things. I could go through quite a few of them, but the premium number alone eliminated, of the 22 marketing organizations that had filed, the premium number alone eliminated, right out of the chute, 19 of them. OK, um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here that relate to uh, sales practice practices and documentation. These are really good questions. Uh, can the printed sales illustration suffice for most of the needed records? Do we need to add an audio file? And in that same vein, uh, another question, uh, piggybacking on that, is the paperwork that is will be required when the rule takes effect be part of the app package we receive, i.e. fact finders, etc.? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question and the answer to that is that the carriers are not most of the carriers have have decided that they do not want to be the financial institution and the disclosures the BIC the 8424 disclosures have to be provided by the financial institution um, I mean certainly the carriers could be nice guys and say hey here are sample disclosures you could use but so far, we have not seen them jumping on that bandwagon to do that, which is part of why we spent so much time and money to bring a platform for our producers that will include those disclosures, because um, it will not be part of the application package. I also believe that um, you have to prepare for the lawsuit that could happen in the future. And unfortunately, a sales illustration, even a client profile coupled with a sales illustration, all by itself is not probably going to give you enough information seven years from now to remember why you picked a particular product that the client or their beneficiary is now claiming was not in their best interest at the time you made the recommendation. So unfortunately, no, I don't think 
that's sufficient. I think you're going to have to have um, a lot more streamlined process and a lot more consistent process. For example, one of the things that I've heard is that some marketing organizations are suggesting that you have an entirely different way of doing business in the qualified market than you would in the non-qualified market. And I highly discourage that. I would highly encourage you to use platforms like what we're bringing for our producers for every client. Because it's just a really, really good fact finder and it is the electronic documentation of the, of the agreement between you and the client on the plan that you provide for them. And so it would allow you then to, seven years from now, defend, look, you know, we went through this process, we did the fact finder, this was their financial situation, these were their goals, these were their dreams, this was the legacy they wanted to provide, this was the gap they had in trying to achieve those goals, and therefore, these were the solutions that I provided, and here is where they electronically signed that they acknowledged and agreed that we were on the right path with one another. And so I, I think you're going to have to up your game. I think if you don't have a contact management system in place right now where you're you know, um, kind of tracking your clients and when you met them and correspondence that you have between them with the discovery process, I think you're missing an important piece there, and good news is that's another part of the platform we're going to bring you. If you don't have a good contact management system and you work with INA, you're about to. So um, I think there's a lot more to it, Tom. And then um, the, the platform that we will offer, there's a question about um, will the uh, package that or the platform that we have in place uh, show the clients um, what their needs are, and absolutely yes, and that's that's what we're bringing to you. Um, we're we're running close on time, but I, I've got another question here. I think is important to uh, to address. Um, I'll couple these together. So, Lori, uh, does the ENO insurance that uh, we are offering at a discount um, apply to only products purchased through INA? And then in that same uh, topic, um, I'm getting close to retirement. Does this mean I will need to continue ENO you know, coverage long after I retire? Okay, so typically ENO you know, coverage covers you um, for transaction that occurred at the time the policy was in place. You certainly want to make sure that the ENO you know, coverage you have has that stipulation because no, you certainly wouldn't want to, um, you know, continue to pay E&O coverage for forever if you're no longer in need of it. So you certainly want to ask those questions. And yes, it is a full-blown E&O policy. It is not one that we are personally providing. In other words, we're not insuring you. Um, we again have partnered with an organization to bring that to you, and it is a full-blown E&O coverage policy. So it should cover. Um, all of your needs, even um, there's a component for those of you who are in the security side of the world um, for those sorts of transactions. So it's not even just an insurance only package. There are two depending on what your needs are. Okay, well we hopefully answered uh, a number of these questions. There's, we couldn't get to all of them because we're at the uh, top of the hour. But uh, again, uh, phenomenal questions. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for uh, your engagement and being part of this call today. Um, I want to thank Lori. And um, if uh, we will be following up with all of you and, and with the questions we did not get to. And if you have questions in the meantime, please don't wait. Give us a call. You see the number there, 800-456-7999. Uh, Reach out to your marketer. And uh, again, to reiterate uh, our goal on this call, uh, our intent here was really uh, to uh, show you that you have a partner in us and we have a clear path and a compass to guide you, uh, not only just to move through these changes in the industry, whether the DOL ruling is 
uh, in place. It's delayed, uh, but we're here to help you thrive through this. With with uh, change, there is always opportunity, and we've always approached it in that manner. And we intend uh, to be here to stay and help you continue to protect your practice and uh, do what you do best, which is helping your clients plan for their retirement and uh, cover any gaps they have. So with that, uh, with uh, the time today, we went a little bit over, but I want to thank you all again for your engagement. And we look forward to talking to you soon. And again, if you uh, want to be part of our call in, in a couple of weeks to go through some of the training um, of these platforms that we're bringing to you, um, let us know. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a terrific Thursday, and um, we'll talk to you all soon.